grief carves a canyon so that joy may overflow it. Mm, I love that. I love that imagery. Mm -hmm. Grief, grief carves a canyon, makes, makes a negative space so that joy can come in. So the deeper the grief, the more joy, you know, has to come Mm -hmm. to cover it. So like, you can't really know the sweetness of joy without contrasting it to the depths of grief. So if you are going through a lot of grief, just know the joy that will compensate for that grief is going to be amazing. Welcome to The Brave Place, where we journey into the lives of brave men and women who have beat the odds or who are in the trenches right now. Difference makers who have truly discovered the warrior that lives within and are living it out. This is the place that will inspire, encourage, enlighten, and challenge that brave person that lives deep down within all of us. Welcome back to another episode of The Brave Place. I am hanging out with the man. (laughs) Blessing offer. I am so excited to have you here. Um, Many know you from multiple places. One, of course, the voice back. I I was doing a little research on you and I I loved that whole scene about the voice. And that was the first time your parents Mm. ever even heard you sing. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, Which is wild. First time? Yep. What, what in the world? What yeah, were their thoughts? They were like, what's going on? I was like, guys, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a singer. And they're like, no, you're going to be a lawyer like your uncle. And I was like, Ooh. So at first were they kind of like not okay with it? Were well, they listen, thinking this guy's chasing some ridiculous dreams or immigrant culture is built for success, right? So when you come to America, you don't come to be a songwriter. You come to be a lawyer or in finance or a doctor or, you know what I mean? That's what we come here to do. And so when I go, Hey, I'm going to do this thing in the entertainment industry, you know, singer songwriter. My parents are like, Oh God, no, (laughs) (laughs) they're like, absolutely not. Absolutely. But like (laughs) they, they, they're fine now and they love it. Um, That is wild. Was that a turning point for you? Like musically, would you say that helped you? It's funny. The voice was super, super helpful. It was kind of a way to get into meetings. As you can imagine, like back when American Idol was like juggernaut, once you were on on American Idol, you got a record. Mm -hmm. And then when the voice kind of came up, there were a lot more of those. So I always say the voice was a really good entry okay, um, and, and just a wonderful experience all around. I pretty much moved right to Nashville and started writing songs three times a day as I did for a while before I got my record deal. So, um, but the voice helped a lot. I mean, here you are, you sit today nominated for a couple of Grammys, mm-hmm. you got some Dove Awards mm-hmm. um, and your music is just phenomenal. One of the things I I love about the lyrics to your music, and I know uh, you are definitely a true artist at heart. Mm -hmm. Um, You're so real Mm -hmm. and you're raw about Mm -hmm. your life. And so you're not afraid to be transparent and go into the hard stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But then on the other token, I feel like you have such a healthy mix. So there's also this God factor there Mm -hmm. where you're honest about this is hard stuff, but God's right there with me Mm -hmm. and we can have both. And I think- Life is all full of both, yeah, right? Both and. I know you started out in Nigeria. Born in Nigeria. Yeah. So tell me about that. How'd you get over here to the U.S.? Tell me from the, let's just Ooh, go. Okay. So born in Nigeria, I came to the States with my uncle who played professional soccer. No kidding. So he uh, played for the Nigerian national soccer team. That got him to America where he started playing for colleges. And then actually two years into my life, my grandmother realized like I would turn my face Sideways. So she goes, I don't think blessing C out of his left eye. Mm. And so she was the first person to kind of like clock it, you know? Right. I mean? Just notice something wasn't right. quite right. Because right. I would, I would center my right eye to the center of my body to keep the vision center. You know what I mean? And so she's like, oh, that's interesting. So she was the first person to get my parents to take me to a doctor. And so they diagnosed congenital glaucoma. So my left eye was born without vision. My right eye had the vision. Um, and so Around six, I came to America with my uncle to stabilize the vision that was in my right eye. Um, so I came to the States, went to Yale, grew up in Connecticut. So I went to Yale Eye Center. Um, really, really sweet, wonderful people. Some of my favorite memories were like every time I had a doctor's appointment, I was like, I know. Her name was uh, Corrine. Okay. Uh, wow. You remember her gonna, name? Yes. Uh, and Corrine was always going to bring me cookies. So she would make me cookies at home. And I, with all due humility, I was everybody's favorite. Um, <laughs> Cause you were like singing to him or no, what? <laughs> I was just, I think I was just like a, 
you know, just a really happy kid. Mm. And I was just like, well, hey, we're here. Yale happened. Vision got stabilized, had a lot of surgery. And then right around end of elementary, beginning of middle school, I got shot in the eye with a water gun. And it detaches the retina in the good eye of all of all the things. <gasps> no way. And, Unreal. Uh huh. And so that causes me to lose a bunch of the vision in the right eye. And then that accident happens around the same time. My uncle buys me uh, my first upright piano. Okay. And so this obsession takes hold as I had to sit really still to let some of this surgery heal. Right. So. Post the surgery, they were like, hey, he can't run around for a while. We really need to let this take to see if we can pull back some of that vision, right? And so right around when I had to sit still, there was a piano. Mm. And so all my sitting still happened at the piano. And so all, all of whatever it is I do today is because for a while when I was 12, 13, I had to sit still, you know? Oh, wow. Okay. So let me, let me retrace real mm -hmm. quick. You moved to the U.S., to get your eye checked out at Yale. They're going to see if they can preserve your left eye. Mm, the, the vision in the right Just eye. Just keep the vision in the yeah. right eye. The left eye is not going to happen, Kaput basically. From birth, n never saw anything. Okay. Yeah. And so... So we weren't worried about that one. <laughs> that was successful. <laughs> yes. And that and you were how old whenever that happened? You know, eight, seven, okay. eight, yeah. And you continue to live with your uncle. Mm -hmm. You're hanging out in the U.S., mm -hmm. He's playing pro soccer. Yep. He's at this point um, a going into law school. Okay. So athletics brought him here. He went to all the schooling and now he's just a smart guy in law school. Man, <laughs> your uncle's a cool man. He's, he's really a cool, cool dude. Yeah. Um, and so then you're living with your uncle, hanging out in the backyard mm -hmm. with water guns, yep. shot in the right eye, mm -hmm. the good eye. The good eye. Now we're in emergency surgery mm -hmm. situation yep. Yep, yep, after yep. surgery. You're at the piano. Your uncle gets you a piano and so, because you're having to let your eye heal in, in hopes of that. Correct. Okay. I'm, I'm caught up. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so right around, I mean, this is, we're getting into eighth grade, ninth grade. I hear about this arts magnet school and it's the school where they, they pull, they pull kids from all over the surrounding towns and they say, Hey, we'll set up these auditions. And if you pass, you get to go to this extra education for whatever your art is. For me, it was music. So we had an audition. I got it. I made it in. And so for all of high school, after taking my core classes in Hamden, Connecticut, I would get on a bus with about 20 other kids and they would drive us into New Haven for four more hours of school. But music related. Music for me. Yeah. yeah. Some other, some kids were acting, some kids were, you know, writing, okay. some kids were visual arts, but yeah, for me, it was obviously music. So, okay. That's then music really got serious because I was like, man, if I could be home at two, but I'm going to choose to be home at five mm -hmm. because I really love this thing. Yeah. And I want to give it my afternoon and figure out homework further into the night. So I didn't end up going to bed till like 11, but it was worth it. Yeah. You're passionate yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, music is a huge part of your life. Mm -hmm. Did you know that would be that way? Like, would, would you be six or seven years old and you're just singing around the kitchen no. and someone's like, oh my goodness, this guy. Nope. He, no, nothing no, like that. No, no. I was musical, but I loved basketball. <laughs> okay. And I loved anything that involved not sitting still. Right. And so every time I'd go to piano lessons, like as a seven, eight, nine year old, the, uh, my teacher would try to teach, teach me classical music. <laughs> and I would, I would swing everything. I'd turn everything really jazz. Mm. And so like, she was like, okay, well, her name is Marie Celso. Props, Miss Marie. Um, she'd say, well, Blessing needs to go, you, you should get him some jazz lessons because he has this really natural desire to, to play differently and, and blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of how we pivoted into, into jazz. Mm -hmm. But music was always like, even back in Nigeria, my whole family sings. Everybody mm. sings, but like. No one goes, oh, you should do this for a living where I'm from. You just, you just sing because everybody sings. You know right. I mean? So it wasn't until I got older, probably middle school, high school, that I was like, wait, I want to be a songwriter. You know? Okay. <laughs> what were you listening to? What was inspiring you? Everything. Okay. Um, Any heroes in there? All of them. The Jacks, Michael Jackson, everything, Motown, Marvin Gaye, Stevie, Beatles. Um, 
My uncle was a huge Lionel Richie fan. So my uncle from Nigeria knew a couple artists. He okay. knew, nine, he knew uh, Lionel Richie and he knew Dolly Parton. Okay. Like what a wild thing. No that these guys kidding. have got so far into the world that like soccer players in Nigeria knew their songs. So uh, I, I grew up kind of listening to all the stuff he grew up listening to. Any music I could get my ear to, I was really into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who, who's your favorite out of all of those? Mm. Like Lionel Richie, uh, I, Stevie I'm a, Wonder. I'm a huge Marvin fan. I'm a okay. huge Donny Hathaway fan. I'm a huge James Taylor fan. Okay. I just love songwriters. I love people that are great communicators. Stevie is God. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like they're just some untouchable deities, Paul McCartney. You know yeah. what I mean? Realizing this talent that you have, there's got to be, There's. I mean, you've lost sight in your mm-hmm. right eye. Yep. So there's got to be some true, legit grief yes. happening there. Yeah. So as a, a young kid, I mean, 12, 13 years old, that's a very, you know, impressionable age, vulnerable age. You could go a lot of directions with that. You could go into full blown rebellion and just say, you know what? I'm done with you God. Yeah. Like this happened or you can lean into God. Maybe you did a little bit of both. I'm just curious how you navigated that. Here's where I always put a pause and a pin in something and go, the easy story here to, is to be like, but God was right there the whole time and everything was great. <laughs> right. And I think sometimes that's what people want to hear. Mm-hmm. And I think the more we tell that, pardon me, cheesy mm-hmm. story, the less the world believes you. Mm. Cause I don't think that's how that goes. Right. Yeah. There was not a part of me that doubted God for a second. Right. But it was really hard. And like, like my dad was the first Christian in our immediate family back in Nigeria. So I've memorized John 316 at two years old, right? Yeah. But when I came to the States, honestly, my uncle didn't really go to church. And so it wasn't like I was steeped in Christian. Right. You know, but I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt because my dad taught me, you know what I mean? And so as all this was happening, I was questioning and wrestling and, and quite frankly, it was like, it wasn't so much God, what's going on? It was like, will my friends still like me? Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was like, wait, everybody's used to me being this great athlete and now I can't play basketball anymore. Mm. So like, I think sometimes we forget the day-to-day tangible thing that is struggle in exchange for saying something like, and then the valley was low. <laughs> but like, what is, it makes my head explode. What does that mean? Right. Yeah. When I was 13, it was me worrying that I wouldn't have friends anymore. Mm. Right. And I think when we can go into the world and be honest, because yes, I was worried, even with all the faith I had, right? Like just because you have faith doesn't mean you're free from humanity. You're still human. And sometimes, you know, we, we say the world does this toxic positivity thing. I think Christians do the toxic positivity thing where it's like, don't worry guys, you have just enough faith and it's good. And you like, Mm-hmm. You know, you do that like rah, rah victory thing and people hear it and and then they go, wait, but I don't, I'm still having a hard time. Am I not Christian enough? Right? Mm. And my deepest want with everything I do is to say to people that not every day has to be a victory. Uh, even on the days where it's not a victory, God's still there. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, Jesus never said, once you follow me. You're golden. Right. Right. He had the worst sales pitch ever. It was, they're going to hurt you. Pick up your cross and follow me. Yeah. Right. It, it's a sales pitch that, you know, generally would not work. Mm-hmm. Right. Being a believer does not pull you out of the day-to-day struggles of going, will my friends still like me? Mm-hmm. And so everywhere I go, I always say, listen to my voice. You can both know God deeply and still wonder if you'll have friends. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's as soon as you can be honest about that, your heart will be better. Yeah. I yeah. love that. Yeah. yeah. And another thing that Jesus sells pitch where he said, you know, in this life, you'll have many troubles. Yes. He never guaranteed us a life without troubles. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and I, I really appreciate that viewpoint, just the acceptance of this is hard mm-hmm. and it's okay to say it's hard mm-hmm. and it's okay to admit your insecurities and, the, the parts of life that you don't want to tell anyone, 
it's okay to talk about it. And, and I think you do that in your music so well. And, and that's what I want to talk about a little bit about your, your album, my tribe, which mm. is phenomenal. Thank you. And, uh, I just appreciate your words. And, um, my son and I, we listen to brighter days. Like <laughs> it's our job, don't we? But yeah. He's, he's sitting in on this interview with us. And so my accountant he, thanks you deeply. <laughs> <Your account. laughs> there you go. Um, but so much good stuff. And, and I just want to know where you think, like from your own heart, where you even have the courage to, to be so honest about that. And yeah. you, you're just real. You're, you're authentic. You're yourself. <laughs> and so I want to know where does that come from within you? Um, There's a security there. Yeah. I can only be who God made me to be. And I can only... The desires in my heart, if I take the time to be quiet and still and and kind of center myself on all the right things, the desires I have are because God put them in there. I grew up in Nigeria and Connecticut, which are not places you'd think of as churched. And so I, I think to myself, I want to make music for my friends who are super kind and wonderful and don't go to church. And so I want to make music that they can walk into without having an advanced degree in Christianese. And I know that if I throw fluent Christianese at them, they're going to go, mm, nope. Right. Right. But if I, like Paul says, if I strive to be a Greek for the Greeks, right. And a, and a, a Jew for the Jews, et cetera. He goes, whatever I need to do to, to spread the gospel. So if I say to myself, okay, I know so-and-so isn't quite ready for, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave, but he might be ready for brighter days, mm. right? He might be ready for something a little more nuanced. He might be ready just for a love song, right? And and so when I signed with Capital, I said, hey, listen, guys, I'm going to make music that I would listen to in Connecticut and in New York. And we have to find a piece about that because, you know, not every minute is like a worship song. Mm-hmm. So like... You know, that's, that's just what I strive to. I just want to be real. Like if I don't like it, then why would I want so-and-so to like it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and God obviously wired you that way. Um, and that's how he wants to use you. Um, and just you, um, you know, being a blind man, um, some people would look at that and, and think, oh man, I don't know how he does that every day. <laughs> you know? Yep. They sure would. Yeah. And so I want to know. How have you seen that be a huge gift in your life? How has God used that? You know, I think that mindset is everything. And where I'm from, life is hard is the given, right? It's the basis. Life is hard. Check, right? So if I'm going through something that's hard, I don't go, God, this isn't fair. I go, yeah. Right? So that's a different mindset than than I encountered in America. Right. In America, we have the understanding that whether we verbalize it this way or not, life should be good. Mm. Right. So it's like a, a topsy turvy understanding. Life should, because people go, life's not fair. And the answer in Nigeria is, yeah, correct. <laughs> Whereas the answer in the West is, God, how come this isn't, this isn't fair? It's like, I lost a bunch of that vision in my right eye. And that was very painful. And, and the struggle was real. And life's not fair. Yes. And then I get music. I get the community I've gotten. I get the career I have. I get the people that have welcomed me into their life. I get so much from God. And so if God sees fit to take vision, okay, I could dwell on that. But also hear all the other things that he in his kindness has brought me. And so how do you weigh that? Mm. Except to go, okay, God. You're still, he's still good, you know, because he didn't have to do any of it. And so I think sometimes, again, avoiding cheesiness, it's not about going, this isn't hard at all. But like whatever, I, I say this to people and I think they freak out. We're all disabled somehow. Mm. Right. Everybody, I wouldn't want to deal with depression. I wake up 99 times out of a hundred, the happiest person you've ever met. And so I get mental well-being. Right. I, I get to, I get to be me, (laughs) you know what I mean? And honestly, that guy's winning right now. And so uh, someone might have all their vision, but they wake up and can't quite think of a reason to get out of bed. And so I think 
when you see someone who is quote unquote disabled, you go, that's so sad. How did they do it? But like, we're all walking through something, right? Um, not being able to see is not hard, believe it or not. I don't, I don't mean that in a brave way, but like, you should see what my iPhone does. It's crazy, right? So the world's fine. I'm fine. But it's because I understand that my physical material well-being is not the point of God in my life, right? And I think that's something we all misunderstand. If God loves us, then we must be healthy? No. We must have money? No. We must have a nice house? No. We must live in a nice neighborhood? No. None of that matters. That has nothing to do with God. Me not seeing says nothing about God except that you know, like Jesus says, when the, when, when those guys walk up and they say, how come this guy was blind? Who sinned? And Jesus said, he's blind so that God might be glorified. That's right. right? So all that to say, one thing does not equal the other thing. You know what I mean? That was a big old rant. Oh, I'm, I'm captivated. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Uh, your words are powerful and God's using you in a mighty way. Um, not just through your music, but through moments like these conversations like these. So I'm truly grateful for what you're doing throughout this world, man. Thank you. You're just awesome to talk to. Thank so you. I really appreciate just your honesty and openness and, yeah. and wisdom. So Cheers. I can tell you're, you're rooted in the, the right stuff. So it's you know, God. It's, so. it's God. It's my dad. It's my uncle. It's my family. It's good soil. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. Well, just wrapping up here, what would you say to someone who is in that, mm. that dark place right mm. now. And um, they're trying to hang on to the yeah. words you're saying and just maybe a word of encouragement to that yeah. person. What helps me often is to realize that there's actually, there's a lot of false, well-meaning gospel going around and to steep yourself in who Jesus actually is. What it means to know him is some of the best things you could ever do, which like I said earlier, whatever condition moment you might be in, how God feels about you or where he is in that moment is so, so, so different from what you might think it is. Like if you are going through struggle, it doesn't mean God forgot you, right? It just means in this life you'll have struggle, right? So the Bible is actually really good at rooting you and redirecting you. Mm -hmm. to what the truth is, right? So struggle doesn't mean he doesn't love you, right? Pain doesn't mean he forgot. It's hard. Nobody should undercut that it's hard, but to keep in mind that even when you're going through the worst of it, Jesus is there, Mm -hmm. right? And his love is probably stronger for you than ever you could think it would be. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? And he wants to celebrate when it's over and he wants to be there when you are in pain and because he's been through pain, Mm -hmm. he's not giving you anything that he himself hasn't dealt with, Mm -hmm. right. Or overcome. That's why he can, he can talk to you about overcoming because he's, he's done it. And when you can be really honest about grief, then joy is all the sweeter, right? There's this, I love this quote from a guy named Albert Camus, who's a mid 20th century existentialist post-World War II, blah, blah, blah. blah. I'm a nerd. Sorry. So (laughs) Camus says, grief carves a canyon so that joy may overflow it. Mm, I love that. I love that imagery. Mm -hmm. Grief, grief carves a canyon, makes, makes a negative space so that joy can come in. So the deeper the grief, the more joy, you know, has to come Mm. to cover it. So like, you can't really know the sweetness of joy without contrasting it to the depths of grief. So Mm -hmm. if you are going through a lot of grief, just know the joy that will compensate for that grief is going to be amazing. Wow. We're hanging out with blessing offer. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I love it. Um, Thanks for joining us for another episode of the brave place. Uh, If you have any comments about what you heard today, you can always email me at Christy at KLRC.com. Christy spells C H. R-I-S-T-Y at KLRC.com. I'd love to hear from you. And one last thing, Blessing, <laughs> if course. someone wants to find you, what's the best place? Hey, uh, Blessing, B-L-E-S-S-I-N-G, O-F-F-O-R, offer. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, all of the above. Just follow along. It's uh, 
It's going to get exciting. Well, I'm going to follow you forever. Please. I'm stalking you. <laughs> Let's go. I'm stalking you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Brave Place, part of the KLRC Podcast Network. 